At a high level, it's possible to say most video games are comprised of two parts. The game logic, which takes input from the player, operates on it and produces an output, and the audio-visual renderings of said output. Because of the latter element, it's easy to see how video games can draw techniques from other media as ways of communicating ideas. However, while replacing the images and sounds might change the context and meaning of the work, you still have a game that's functionally identical unless you change its logic. And that's because the fundamental building blocks of a game are its systems. According to Google Dictionary, a system can be described as a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, an organized scheme or method. Another way of looking at this description could be a set of rules causing behavior to occur over time, which is how Jonathan Blow, the designer behind Braid, describes this fabric that we use to create games. From a simple game of tic-tac-toe to the complex emergent behaviors of Dwarf Fortress, all games are governed by rules. And while Blow certainly doesn't ignore the value that can be added to a game through its aesthetics, it is first and foremost through the thorough exploration of the systems that he expects to extract meaning in his works. His process is heavily focused on exploring the possibility space offered by the game's rules and curating the most interesting results, placing them in an aesthetically rich package, not only in terms of game feel and rule consistency, but also audio-visual elements. As a result, Braid is a game that springs almost entirely out of the consequences of its central mechanic, time manipulation. While there is a very deliberate structure to how everything plays out, the end product seems to be a sort of melting pot of various ideas about how we, as humans, relate to the passage of time. Jonathan Blow himself has stated he doesn't fully understand everything he puts in his works, and that's what makes him interested to pursue these topics in the first place. Of course, in my game critic hubris, I've decided to attempt to put into words the things its creator prefers to leave unspoken. And to do so, we'll begin by diving into some of the material that inspired the game's theme before taking a look at how its worlds and levels explore these ideas. And to close things off, we'll look at some of the recurring motifs throughout the work in order to construct an interpretation of the game's meaning. As usual, this video will contain spoilers and is better understood if you've played the game, so you've been warned. In Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, there's a passage where Marco Polo is asked to describe his hometown of Venice to Kublai Khan. His answer is that with every description of one of the invisible cities of the book, he has also been talking about Venice all along. All of his musings on the fantastical cities of the Khan's empire are not just about the places themselves, they are about culture and the humans that shape and are shaped by said culture. By diving deeply into this subject, Polo reaches fundamental truths that apply to humanity as a whole. Inspired by Calvino's work, physicist Alan Lightman wrote a book in a similar approach called Einstein's Dreams. Much like how Calvino uses city descriptions as a means of exploring the human condition, Lyman uses dreams to explore our relationship with time, from the individual to the cultural level. Together, these two books form a continuum that Jonathan Blow set out to add to with his work on Braid. The way these authors explore a unique concept to their fullest consequences evokes the image of something that's very recurrent when listening to Jonathan Blow talk, the fractal. The idea that you could pick any point and dive infinitely and still reach a place as deeply complex as the one you started on is a lot like the way these artists approach picking a subject and extract as much meaning as they can from it by understanding their nuances and behaviors in different circumstances. Any one of the worlds described in both books presents a concept rich enough to build an entire novel around but also general enough that they can make statements on the nature of humanity in a concise manner. They are at the same time the result of a deep exploration of an idea and an interesting jumping off point to a different story, very much like any given point of a fractal. I mention this because originally Blow wanted to explore multiple aspects of quantum physics with Braid, 
But after implementing the bidirectional flow of time through the rewind mechanic, he realized how bountiful the possibility space for this single functionality was and decided to focus the entire game on it. However, this approach of narrowing things down to a single concept to be investigated by the author was not the only way these works would affect the structure of Braid. In a talk about the influence of Italo Calvino on his works, Jonathan Blow highlights one of the more interesting aspects of Invisible Cities in its approach to structure. As soon as the reader reaches the table of contents, they are faced with a set of chapters followed by numbers in no immediate discernible order. All of this is very disorienting on a first impression, but those looking for patterns will realize that there's some sort of logic behind it. Each chapter name appears five times, and most sets of chapters will follow a 5-4-3-2-1 structure, meaning one topic is closed and another is introduced in every set. That is, except for the first and last ones, which have a more complex structure. But looking closely, we can understand how they actually mirror each other, total polar opposites, but also complementary in a way that creates a sort of cyclical nature to the book, especially when visualized in this manner. With this meticulous organization, Calvino gains the trust of the reader that a degree of thought has been put into the various aspects of the work, enticing them to search for the complexities hidden by the author and ponder the meaning of things. This exploration of the many aspects of a single subject is reflected in the composition of the chapter titles in Calvino's book and replicated in the titles for Braid's worlds. It consists of the main subject of the work coupled with one aspect being delved into. So Invisible Cities has chapters named Cities and Desires, Cities and Symbols, or Cities and Eyes. While Braid's worlds have names along the lines of Time and Forgiveness or Time and Decision. The only exceptions are World 1, which has no title, and World 6, which is simply named Hesitance. This use of structure to grab a player's attention is employed in Braid when the first world they visit is named World 2. This poses the question of where is World 1 and imbues it with greater significance, setting up a mystery about what happened before the game began. Coupled with what the books describe at the beginning of World 2, it also works to set up the twist at the end of the game for Tim's unreliable narration. Another interesting aspect to World 2 is how two of the puzzle pieces for the Cloud Bridge level cannot be acquired until later stages are completed. This sets up the idea that stages can be completed in any order, allowing players to skip puzzles they might find particularly difficult. This non-linearity is also a trait of Calvino's book, which can be read in a variety of ways. Front to back or back to front are equally valid, but you could also, as an experiment, read the five chapters for each topic in order, jumping all over the pages from chapter to chapter. These methods still present cohesive ways of experiencing the main part of the book, meaning the city descriptions. And the same is true for the puzzle pieces in Braid. Maybe this seems like a stretch because the worlds in Jonathan Blow's works are made available in a mostly linear manner, but it's important to note that both Invisible Cities and Einstein's Dreams also have framing narratives that develop linearly throughout their respective books. The House in Braid is the game's version of the frame narrative reinterpreted as a sort of hub world. The similarities with Alan Lightman's work are a bit more apparent due in no small part to how both Braid and Einstein's dreams use the concept of time behaving in different manners as a way of exploring human existence. Some concepts in Braid seem almost lifted directly from the book, which is understandable given these behaviors are based on real scientific knowledge of how time behaves in certain conditions. One example off the top of my head is the chapter of May 14th, 1905, in which time slows down the nearer a person comes to a certain spot, which is exactly the way the ring works in World 6 of Braid. In that dream, Lightman describes the motivation of people that go towards the spot where time stands still, showcasing the human desire to make certain moments last longer or even forever. And this is very similar to the situation the books in World 6 describe when illustrating the ring's significance. The idea to frame these scenarios where time behaves differently as dreams is also something that seems to have influenced Braid's aesthetics. Firstly, we have the transition screens between the house and the worlds. The shifting clouds in the background evoke the classic imagery of cartoons and comics where dreams and thoughts are portrayed inside of cloudy bubbles. 
and the books seem to contain introspective thoughts while the doors lead to worlds where Tim's musings and desires on the nature of time can become real. These worlds also have more fantastical elements attached to them, from the typical grassy fields that serve as the setting for the first level of so many platformers, to the chaotic mesh of disparate items in World 5, or even the decaying ruins of the epilogue. By comparison, the house where we access these dreams is just that, a plain house. It even has a bathroom which, weirdly enough, adds a degree of authenticity and groundedness to it, since a lot of games, especially side-scroller ones, usually leave these sort of details out. This interpretation of the worlds as a part of Tim's subconscious opens up the door to understanding the books in a more metaphorical way. Mentions to the atomic bomb have led many people to conclude Tim was a scientist working on some sort of weapon. But Jonathan Blow himself has stated this is only a small part of the text, and getting hung up on that and claiming to have quote-unquote figured out the meaning of the game is antithetical to his philosophy as it relates to meaningful art. Thinking of the princess as a concrete, literal entity, be it a girl or an atom bomb, makes it hard to reconcile the different ways she is portrayed in different worlds. Of course I have my own idea of what I think she symbolizes, but we'll get to that later. For now there's something else I want to get into, because I began the video noting how systems are a fundamental part of what makes games interesting for Jonathan Blow. So how does all this literature relate to that? To answer that, we'll have to talk about math for a little bit. Because math is both the tool we use to explain the universe and the tool we use to build these complex systems we call games, Blow believes every game at its core reveals some truth about the world around us. As mentioned earlier, the idea is that, as a game creator, his job is not so much to create interesting scenarios, but instead to unearth the unexpected and captivating consequences of the game's systems and package them for players to appreciate. This truth-seeking framework of game design doesn't seem to me to be so far off from what Calvino and Lightman do when trying to explore human behavior through the lens of concepts like space and time, respectively. Again we have to go back to Marco Polo's statement, quote, Every time I describe a city, I am saying something about Venice, unquote. This is not a statement of how Venice is some sort of mega city that encompasses characteristics of all other cities. It is a statement on the universal nature of the things he's found on his journey. Every city description, as well as every dream world in Einstein's dreams, tackles some sort of truth about our existence. Much like in Braid, every puzzle piece tackles an interesting outcome of how time behaves when different properties are applied to different kinds of objects. These different outcomes are coupled with the plot and aesthetics of the game as a method of relating them to the human experience. Exactly like how Invisible Cities and Einstein's Dreams don't stop at the description level of the physical space or the mechanics of time, they always make a point of discussing how the people who live in these places affect and are affected by them. As a deep dive into how we relate to time in the real world, Braid uses its structure as a way of dividing this main subject into different aspects to be explored. As such, it seems appropriate for this analysis to go world by world looking into some of the more interesting concepts in each one. World 2 was our de facto introduction to the systems of Braid, and as such, it seeks to explore one of the more immediate questions that comes to mind in this sort of time travel fiction. What would you do if you could rewind time? Narratively, it's pretty upfront in tackling the idea of correcting mistakes. We all heard the joke about going back in time and killing baby Hitler, or some variation of that. And what lies at the center is the human urge to fantasize about a world where we could undo the mistakes of the past by using the knowledge acquired by living through the consequences of said mistake. Or as Braid puts it, we could remove the damage but still be wiser for the experience. The interesting part, however, is that games already operate under that logic to a certain degree. A mistake in a game is almost never permanent. At most, it might cost you some time in the real world, but the experience of the mistake prepares you to face the challenge with increased knowledge. There's always a next time. 
games can be forgiving in that manner, but Braid's mechanics definitely push this aspect to the forefront. This extrapolation of a concept so intrinsical to most video games is the key to what makes this world interesting. It makes a point of evoking very familiar imagery to relate itself to more traditional platformers, which then compounds how fundamentally different things can get when the player has the ability to correct their mistakes immediately by rewinding time. Like mentioned earlier, this world is set in a grassy field, the somewhat cliché first level setting for a lot of classic platformers, and it also introduces enemies very reminiscent of Goombas and Piranha Plants from Super Mario Bros. All of this referencing of a classic aesthetic serves the purpose of highlighting the ways in which Braid breaks that formula with its approach to death and time manipulation. A very clear illustration of this subversion is in the Leap of Faith level. It is a commonly held belief that leaps of faith in platformers are a sign of poor level design. But when time can be reversed immediately, this kind of spatial arrangement becomes an interesting challenge for the player to overcome, instead of a frustrating exercise in blindly guessing the designer's intent. It's important to remember the game never tells the player that they have the ability to rewind until they have died for the first time. In this manner, the game sets its main mechanic as a sort of surprise to subvert player expectations after they've been playing it for a couple of levels in a very traditional setting. As such, this game works almost as a type of meta-commentary of the game on itself and how its central mechanic challenges some aspects of traditional design. While we're talking about the setting, I have to mention the game's art style, particularly in this first world, reminds me quite a bit of Van Gogh's Starry Night, or maybe Cypress's, or maybe just his general aesthetic. As a post-impressionist painter, Van Gogh was a lot more focused on translating a particular mood into the canvas rather than emulating its subject's true physical properties, which makes for a highly subjective work. I haven't found any acknowledgement of this similarity being intentional, but I think it fits nicely with the idea of this being a journey of introspection into the main character's mind. One last thing I would like to mention before moving on to the next world is about the infamous star collectible hidden in the Cloud Bridge level. I've seen readings on the nature of this item range from a cruel joke on Jonathan Blow's part to a commentary on the obsessive nature of chasing every little secret the game has to offer. While I do think there is some validity to both interpretations, I think there's another angle to it that I don't remember being mentioned anywhere I looked. Braid is a game about time and our relationship to it. And as a designer, Blow believes in exploring concepts to their fullest extents, even if the result is not traditionally fun. So when reading this challenge within this context, I believe the star should be recognized more as a meditation on the one aspect of our relationship with time that goes mostly unexplored throughout the rest of the work, the act of waiting. It is frustrating and exhaustive because it runs in direct opposition to a lot of the other ways in which we interact with time throughout the game. It is disempowering. All the other mechanics allow for some sort of wish fulfillment, but this is the one time-related puzzle that actually works within real-world terms, and it is terrible, but without it, the game might feel incomplete. And I know this may seem like a particularly self-indulgent idea to some people, but we have to remember this was made optional for a reason. More so than any of the following worlds, World 3 seems to be set up as a direct response to its predecessor. In World 2, the game explores the fantasy of being able to live a life without any mistakes. But in this world, it brings up the idea that erasing mistakes also erases the opportunity for growth. The metaphor used in the books of this chapter is that of a perfect relationship that eventually grows stale and limiting. The gameplay illustrates how breaking away from this limitation can enrich the experience. The desire to correct our mistakes without being punished was explored in the previous world through the use of Rewind, but after that set of levels is done, there's not much more the game can do other than cover old concepts in new settings and arrangements. The rewind ability fulfills a very real human urge, but it's only when coupled with the items exempt from time manipulation introduced in World 3 that the possibility space for the mechanic truly explodes. In other words, it's the uncontrollable nature of certain objects that allows the game to grow beyond its starting concept. 
Much like how the relationship described in the books for this world can't evolve without some sort of friction. I think the most interesting example of this concept applied mechanically is in the level Irreversible. In this particular instance, the magic objects are not only beyond the player's control, but are effectively an active deterrent for the rewind ability as well, since using it might cause the level to become unbeatable. The way that time-exempt elements are arranged essentially turns this level into a more traditional platformer for a few moments by reintroducing long-term consequences to player mistakes. Braid doesn't have a checkpoint system, but the only way to solve the puzzle if you make a mistake is to leave the level and come back in, much like a checkpoint. The background for this world pairs contrasting elements with the sunlit forest coexisting with the rain particles and sound. This could be an allusion to the dichotomy of wanting to fix and control mistakes, but also longing for the thrill of the unknown, two incompatible desires that coexist within ourselves. Or perhaps the sunny forest is a facade for the idyllic relationship that hides something troublesome underneath represented by the rain. Either way, this mixing of disparate elements for the background is a trend subsequent worlds seem to follow as well. Moving on to World 4, the game introduces an entirely new behavior to the passage of time by tying it to the player's position on the level's horizontal axis. This effectively combines time and space to a very literal degree. And once again, the books relate themselves to this main subject of the world, this time describing how certain places can evoke memories and, in a sense, transport us through time to a different period of our lives. The very way in which the five books are spatially arranged in the cloud room is also related to the way the levels behave, meaning the farther to the right they are, the farther in the future its events take place. The first book describes Tim's memory of living with his parents during his childhood or maybe his teenage years. In the second one, he remembers his time in college, presumably as a young adult. The third book describes Tim's present in his current house, pondering how much he changed and what still lies ahead. While the following two books are about him looking towards the future, being excited about plans and possibilities. Interestingly, the farther into the future, the happier the narrator becomes. To him, the future seems to symbolize the potential to be the person he wants to become, while by comparison, his past inadequacies are immutable. Personally, I see this optimism portrayed in the gameplay at the very end of this world, when the dinosaur plushie comes to tell Tim that once again the princess is in another castle, but the player just continues moving forward into the future, ignoring the setbacks and roadblocks to their pursuit of something more important. The levels contained in this world also seem to follow a very similar arrangement to the books, where their solutions transition from dealing with past to present to future the further into the world the player gets. The solutions for the first three levels are related to the past and involve going backwards through space-time to find the Goomba knockoffs in a favorable position. These challenges generally involve advancing time by going to the right to a different elevation or a point of interest, only to then go left and simultaneously back to the past where an enemy once was, using it as a platform or to get to a previously unattainable key. The level Jumpman in particular stands out because the most effective way of solving its puzzles is to go through the platforming challenge on the right, only to go back all the way to the left in the past and solve what would usually be considered the initial challenge of the level. Conversely, the reprise of Hunt on the fourth level is much more related to an idea of present. The solution to the puzzle is to infer the order in which the enemies must be killed by judging their positions on the x-axis at the exact moment the player first enters the room. Through these lens, the level almost reads like a struggle to remain in the present, as moving too far back to the past will reset your progress. Finally, the last three levels are focused on guiding enemies to specific destinations, which evokes an idea of a future location. Movement by Degrees and Fickle Companion both have the player moving between multiple positions in space-time to guarantee that an enemy gets to a certain location. Meanwhile, Movement Amplified has a puzzle where the player needs to know a cloud will be there in the future to assist with the level's platforming to its second puzzle piece. Aesthetically, this world solidifies the trend of contrasting elements first employed by World 3. 
Here the background is a mix of children's toys with decaying ruins, evoking ideas of new and old past and future. I particularly like this platform in Just Out of Reach, which seems to have the notes of the level's music roughly transcribed to their position in space as well. Just a very interesting subtle touch that ties the timing aspect of a song's rhythm to the spatial composition of the level. The next world is called Time and Decision, and it evokes the theory of every choice causing a split in that timeline, effectively creating parallel universes where both decisions play themselves out. Similarly to World 4, the introductory books here are arranged to reflect this theme. Essentially, we have two books describing two realities spawned from different outcomes to the same choice. The left one describes a man who decides to abandon his individual pursuits to stay with a partner that doesn't fully understand him, while the one on the right shows the opposite scenario, where the woman is lamenting the fact that the man left to go after the quote-unquote princess. The world's setting is a mixture of furniture, carpets and pillows placed in the middle of a swamp. It's another mesh of opposing elements like the worlds before it, but especially relevant given the theme of multiple realities that interact with each other. To me they evoke the scenarios described in the books, one where the man stays home and another where he picks up a travel bag to find whatever he's looking for in the outdoors. The painting formed by the puzzle pieces is yet another aesthetic element that supports this theme, as it depicts a boy in two different situations simultaneously. One where he looks excited to go on a trip, and another where he sits begrudgingly at the airport bench. It's a very natural response to imagine alternate realities in our minds when prompted with a choice. Even after a decision has been made, we still fantasize about the possible outcomes that would have played out differently, and much like how World 2 lets us live out the fantasy of being able to correct every mistake by going back in time, World 5 allows us to experience two outcomes of a single choice. Even in the way the mechanic operates, it seems to mirror this human behavior to a certain extent. When we judge how a different decision could have played out, our mental extrapolation can only go so far before the future becomes unpredictable the further it deviates from our reality, until it escapes our grasp entirely, much like the shadow reality in the game. Having this alternate reality exist only for a short period of time could be the effect of a design decision to make the puzzles more challenging, or a programming decision to cut down on having to compute every moving entity in the world twice, but regardless of the motivation, the way it behaves still relates very well to our relationship with the passage of time. It's also reminiscent of Schrodinger's cat. Now, I'm not a physics specialist, so this might not be the most accurate way to describe it, but to those who don't know, Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment meant to make sense of how photons behave like particles and waves at the same time. The idea is that a cat is placed inside of an opaque box together with a device that has a 50-50 chance of killing it. While the box remains closed, we can't know if the device has gone off or not, so at that point in time, the cat is theoretically both alive and dead. It's only when we open the box that one state supplants the other. The mechanic of this world operates in a similar logic in the sense that both realities are equally valid, each with their own properties and affecting each other, until one eventually is and the other isn't. Given the game's interest in quantum physics, I feel like that might not be much of a stretch. The nameless level is particularly interesting given this context, since the solution requires the player to kill themselves in the shadow reality in order to get the key. The idea of both realities being equally valid for a certain duration adds a somber tone to the puzzle. Jonathan Blow has stated that this level was not given a name because he felt this uneasiness was sort of an undescribable feeling, and wanted the gameplay to speak for itself. Personally, I see it as a grim reminder that making a choice always means sacrificing something else, depending on the nature of that choice, maybe even sacrificing a certain version of yourself. There's another instance of having to sacrifice another version of Tim to get to a puzzle piece in the next level, but it's drastically less impactful, and I think the reason why is because that version of Tim is killed by an enemy instead of the player. When the action is placed entirely on our command, it emphasizes how it's our choice to let go of one version of ourselves in favor of another. 
In practical terms, World 6 is the last world of this broader collection where the main objective is focused on gathering puzzle pieces. The books in this world depict Team's inability to let go of a failed relationship, presumably a marriage given the ring. It is portrayed almost like he's stuck in time to a certain degree, he feels like that relationship defined him and he's not ready to be done with it even though others might not understand. This is what the title Hesitance refers to, the fear of moving on from something that meant a lot to you once but is now gone, and also how that fear stalls personal growth. The ring as a symbolic narrative element and as a gameplay mechanic represent this perfectly. In its behavior, the ring is very reminiscent of a black hole. Again, not a physics expert, so this is probably not a great explanation, but in broad terms, the gravitational pull of a black hole, like any other celestial object, gets stronger the closer any subject gets to its center. The difference is that the acceleration is so incredibly high it approaches the speed of light, which makes time dilate, to the point where, theoretically, it would stand completely still at the center of the black hole. This time dilation phenomenon is the logic behind that scene in the movie Interstellar, where they visit a planet orbiting a black hole for only a few hours while years go by on Earth. Well, every hour we spend on that planet will be seven years back on Earth. Well, that's relativity, folks. With this in mind, we can imagine the center of the ring as the center of a black hole. Mechanically, time slows down the closer we get to it while still moving at the regular speed anywhere outside the radius of influence. This allows us to understand how when Tim wears the ring, he is symbolically completely frozen in time. All of that paints the ring in a pretty negative light, but I think the sentence, quote, too long tucked away that part of him might suffocate, unquote, gives us a hint of another possible point of view. Considering the ring is clearly evocative of a marriage, we can presume that there must have been moments of genuine happiness before things ended. These experiences are powerful and inevitably define part of who Tim is as a person. On that aspect, his mentality is not wrong. The true harm comes with the inability to accept when those good moments have run their course, almost as if all those experiences were meaningless unless he gets to live happily ever after, which is not true. The past is not something that must be completely abandoned or completely upheld, it may define who Tim is, but only to a certain extent. The way I see it, this idea is represented in the gameplay, in the way the levels make use of the ring in different approaches the farther you dive into the world. Basically, the levels here can be split into two categories, reprises from old challenges and entirely new ones. The interesting part is how they are distributed along the world's progression. Most of the revisited concepts are placed at the beginning, while the new challenges are placed at the end. What this means is that at first the player is using the ring to relive the past, by playing through the same levels they have already visited, while the latter half of the world, the player starts to see how the ring could be used for things that are new and interesting by themselves. To me, this progression mirrors Tim's journey from dwelling in the past to him realizing how the past can actually be a stepping stone to creating new experiences and overcoming new obstacles. Now, for this to be an exact divide, we would need to swap the placements of Cascade and Impossible Foliage, but maybe this is meant to represent how this realization happens gradually, instead of all at once? I don't know, maybe it feels like I'm stretching the metaphor a little thin, but I find it a very interesting way of looking at the structure of this world, and as we've already seen, structure was definitely something Blow had in mind when designing Braid, so I don't think it's an accident that the levels are placed the way they are. Another gameplay element that seems to support this idea is the use of Rewind, which is not required for any of the puzzle solutions except for the last two. I think this decreased emphasis on the rewind ability might be the reason why time is dropped from the title. In part, this is obviously because the combination of rewind with the ring doesn't yield a lot of interesting possibilities, considering it isn't a time exempt and as such it would rewind together with Tim every time you use the ability. So the only way to mix these mechanics in meaningful ways was to make Tim immune to time manipulation which inevitably makes up for a smaller number of unique scenarios. That being said, the few puzzles that do make use of Rewind didn't need to be grouped together at the end of the world. 
As a matter of fact, it could be tempting to place them farther apart to give the levels a wider sense of variety. But if you accept my reading of the level progression as a metaphor for Tim learning to let the past go, then this would symbolize the end of that journey as the ring becomes just another tool to be leveraged just like Rewind was for the entirety of the game, and now he's able to combine them to get new results. And just to cap things off, the level ends with the dinosaur asking if the princess even exists, almost as if questioning Tim's idealized version of the relationship. All of this right before the player has the chance to put all the puzzle pieces together and see the painting where a man is leaving a ring behind in a trash can, no longer stuck in that moment. However, a figure of a woman still looms over the man's head, perhaps indicating that there's still more things about his past he has yet to come to terms with. And with all of these new experiences and knowledge under their belt, Tim and the player are finally ready to go back to where this whole story began. Throughout the previous worlds, we've seen recurring symbols show up in their respective books, namely a princess and a castle. In this final stretch of the game, we finally see these objects pop up in the game itself, so we can start to make sense of what they mean for the narrative. Placing World 1 after all the other worlds implies these are the events that led up to the introspection scene in Worlds 2 through 6, and to set up this idea of going back to where it all started, time in these levels is perpetually moving backwards. There are more subtle details that imply the reversed movement of time, such as the level doors opening from right to left instead of the usual left to right, as well as the icons depicting a flower blossom in reverse. The short challenges leading up to the final level may seem trivially simple, but they establish the idea that everything in this world is moving backwards in time, and that when Tim uses his rewind ability, he's actually making time move in its original direction. With this warning, the game has given us all the pieces we need to understand its main twist. As we reach the final level, it may seem like the flow of time is back to normal, but once Tim arrives at the princess's house, we finally understand how time was still operating under the same logic as all the preceding levels. With that, all that's left to do is press the rewind button to re-establish the original flow of time and see the correct sequence of events in which the princess is not running away from the night towards Tim, she's doing the exact opposite. All the switches she used to open up the way for Tim are now framed as her attempts to stop him from chasing her. The imagery of this level is very evocative of the very first lines the player reads at the beginning of the game. Tim is searching for the princess. She's being snatched by a horrible and evil monster. This happened because Tim made a mistake. This is where we get to see Tim's mistake and with it arrive at the answer for this mystery set up by the game's surface narrative. But throughout the work, the way the books describe the princess made her out to be more of a metaphor than an actual person. As a matter of fact, this is especially true for the books in World 1, where she is described much more like an allegory for the atomic bomb, which so many people believe is the true interpretation of what the princess is. So when seeing a personification of the princess show up, it can be a little confusing. Were all of those past references to her actually about this character or about a metaphor? What is going on? I think the answer is both. Much like the books that inspired it, Braid has a framing narrative and inside it there are short anecdotes exploring the human condition. Weirdly enough, these two levels of storytelling are both self-contained and interdependent in relation to each other. In this manner, they make use of the symbol of the princess in different ways with different specificities, but in general she stands for something all of these portrayals have in common, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The way I see it, we can summarize the main plot of Braid as follows. Tim drives the princess away, in this context, she stands for a person he cares about. This event triggers his thoughts about the nature of time, place, choice, etc. as seen in the different worlds. As he reaches the end of World 6, there is a realization which allows him to look back at the inciting incident with a new perspective, as represented by World 1. And this leads him to the thoughts contained in the epilogue, which we'll get to shortly. The takeaway is that the levels in which most of the gameplay takes place can be viewed as Tim processing the events that led him where he finds himself at the beginning of the game. But they also exist separate from the main story, and while I wouldn't go as far as to say the main plot is unimportant, it seems to me the real meat of the work lies in the more self-contained worlds. 
So what does the princess mean within this context? To answer that, first we need to have a look at the epilogue. Just as Tim is able to realize there are two perspectives to the events that led the princess to run away, the epilogue is filled with books that showcase this duality. Every event in our lives happens at some point in the time we are alive, but different people can interpret the same events differently, so this final stretch of the game seems to focus on this subjective aspect of time. The theme of subjectivity is enforced by the cloud setting, previously constrained to transition screens between Tim's house and his allegorical adventures of the mind, is now promoted to being the main aesthetic for the game's final sequence, which can be interpreted as Tim moving to a new mentality. Jonathan Blow has described this epilogue as a world falling apart, and this is made evident in the way the background and foreground start to blend together and in the quote-unquote puzzles which don't involve any kind of puzzle piece or star as a reward. The rules of the game are being broken as we play, and this fits the idea of a change in mentality through the deconstruction of the old in order to build something new. At the very end of it all, we find the castle. An idea that has been tied with the image of the princess for much of the game, but somewhat secondary to it. But here it is the final image Braid leaves us with, and I think this is crucial to understanding what it all means. The castle is built using the icons of the levels we've beaten to get here. It is a physical manifestation of our experience with the game. Essentially, it is a monument to the importance of experiencing things for what they are as a method of achieving transcendence, as symbolized by the cloud at the top. Almost like the collection of stones allows Tim to achieve something greater than the sum of their parts. In contrast, the princess symbolizes almost the opposite. She is the embodiment of a goal. It's the quintessential, problematic trope video games have employed since the 80s. Much like World 2 evokes the imagery of Mario to subvert it, the concept of the damsel in distress is used as a proxy for something most players would easily recognize as a goal. She can be read as a metaphor for something Tim is looking for or working towards, so even within the context of the main plot of the game, where the princess is implied to be a real woman Tim was in a relationship with, she still fits the framework of something he pursues as a prize to be conquered, ignoring her perspective on the matter. In a broader sense, this is what the books before World 1 seem to describe, a single-mindedness that drives the narrator towards his objectives, but also makes him alienating to other people. He even wonders how the world would react to him achieving his goals when the things that fascinate him don't seem to be what everyone else cares about. In the end, this seems framed as a cautionary tale against this kind of goal-oriented mindset. Even on a surface level, we can infer it was Tim's lack of perspective which drove his partner away, as visualized in World 1. In a more subtle way, the search for the hidden stars is another method in which the game showcases this concept through its gameplay. These collectibles are incredibly hard to find and push the player's knowledge of the mechanics to their most extreme. They can be very rewarding to pull off, but the end result literally blows up in your face, which is where the atomic bomb references seem to fit with my interpretation of the game. It is a very extreme example of the quest for knowledge yielding devastating results. While the search and the joint effort of the project was impressive, putting those results into practice was later seen as a mistake by Oppenheimer, the man often credited with the creation of the nuclear bomb. In other words, the experience was valuable but the end result wasn't. As the man himself puts it, quote, the physicists have known sin and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. Unquote. A sentiment echoed by Oppenheimer's colleague Kenneth Bainbridge when he said, Now we're all sons of bitches. A quote directly referenced in Braid's epilogue. Now contrast all of this negativity surrounding the princess with the triumphant feeling of climbing the castle and the optimistic outlook the book at its foundation presents. The implication seems to be a defense for a philosophy of being more in touch with the day-to-day -to -day experiences than being attached to plans for an uncertain future. When the game says the princess is in another castle, at first it feels like a defeat, like you haven't reached your goal, but in the end, as you climb the castle and realize what the experience of playing the game meant, it seems worth it. And you almost wish the game would tell you the princess is still in another castle so you could have more meaningful moments to enjoy in this world.
Back in that talk about the influence of Calvino on his works, Blow states he believes there are two broad levels of appreciation we can have for a piece of art. The first is where we still don't understand anything about it, but are captivated by the clues and questions it poses. This stage is about the joy of connecting the dots and slowly developing a larger understanding of what the work means. The other stage of appreciation involves complete understanding. Essentially, it's about knowing what the work is quote-unquote about. Having established this, Blow claims Calvino's books are intentionally built to leave the reader in a state in between those two, where we can understand that there are bigger ideas being portrayed, but can't quite put the finger on what they are. It's unverbalizable, much like Blow's own work on Braid. Because of their interactivity, games seem particularly well suited for this kind of exploration of concepts that transcend written or spoken language, which is why despite having spent the last half hour trying to put into words what I feel Braid is about, I still feel like I'm only scratching the surface of something that needs to be played to be understood. And this idea again fits nicely with what I claim the dichotomy between the princess and the castle represents. The experience of playing Braid is infinitely more valuable than fixating your mind on trying to crack all of its mysteries. When Kublai Khan asks Marco Polo why he never talks about Venice, this is what the explorer has to say. Memory's images, once they are fixed in words, are erased. Perhaps I am afraid of losing Venice all at once if I speak of it. Sometimes boiling something down to descriptions can be limiting, so I think I'll let the game speak for itself. He cannot say he has understood all of this. Possibly he is more confused now than ever. But all of these moments he's contemplated, something has occurred. The moments feel substantial in his mind, like stones. To build a castle of appropriate size, he will need a great many stones. But what he's got now feels like an acceptable start. <laughs>